sweatshirt every Tuesday now. Told you. You want to stay stuff, good things happen. All right. Now, let's talk about number eight. You can always start vertically upward and feels no air resistance once the speed of the hand moving up the two forces act on it are the downward pull of gravity and the upward force due to its motion. Love of God! Can't say that. You throw this thing up in the air, what's the only force acting on it? Gravity. Gravity. There is no upward force due to its motion. Does it have inertia? Yes. Does it want to keep at a constant velocity? Yes. But it slows down because of gravity. Damn it. Shut up. <laughs> so it isn't like when you let go of it, there's a little rocket engine that fires and pr projects it up, which would be cool, don't get me wrong. But that isn't what happens. There's only one force acting on it, and that's gravity. Which is why on number one, the answer is exactly negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Because if you throw something down, even if you throw it, again, once it leaves your oh hand, what's the only force acting on it? Gravity. Now, on number 10, okay, you got a 50 newton box rest horizontal force, da 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 da. So here's the deal. If you take the 50 newtons and you multiply it by the coefficient of friction, you get 25 newtons. So there's a frictional force of 25 newtons holding it in place. You're only applying 20 newtons of force. So what's it not going to do? Accelerate. Accelerate. So the acceleration is zero because your frictional force is more than what you apply. Okay. Uh, Number 12, for the most part, went pretty well. Uh, you just had to subtract out the force weight and boom. Now, the reason that on 14, the reason I had you do this, just as a little bit of comparison, because if you watch Star Trek, Star Wars, whatever, you know, they flip a switch, oh, we're up speed and we're going, you know, faster than the speed of light and like that long. So, even if you're just getting to 10% of the speed of light, Okay, this is just 10% of the speed of light. And this is an acceleration of about 11.2. So you're actually going to feel a little bit heavier than you do right now if you were actually in this spaceship. So it would take you 31 days at that acceleration just to get to 10% of the speed of light, let alone warp speed. So I just put that in there just for a little bit of comparison. Um, 17 drove me nuts. God, we did this problem again and again and again. Always look at all the forces that are acting on this thing. You got a 10,000 Newton force acting up. You got gravity pulling down. The difference between those two is the net force. Divide that by the mass. There's your acceleration. Now, what I found odd is that some of you actually mathematically got negative time. Like, you, you, when you took V minus V naught and you divide it by the acceleration and you use like negative 1.67 meters per second squared, and you actually got negative time. And then you just magically wrote positive, like you acted like it wasn't there. If what you're doing creates a value of negative time, something is wrong, okay? You just can't act like it's not there and wish it away and go, well, I'll, I'll just make it positive, okay? No, bad. Uh, on 18, without fail, probably the most common mistake was that you got that 14 seconds up on C, how long it's going to take to come to a rest, and then when you drew your velocity time graph, you picked 14. Okay, no, it's a running clock. It's four seconds till the engine shuts off, and it's 14 seconds beyond that. That's the only way you can get a slope of negative 9.8 meters per second squared, because it takes 14 seconds from the time that the engine is shut off, so it should cross that 18. Can we change the midterm to like word problems instead of multiple choice? I'm not a fan of multiple choice. It's all, the, a lot of the multiple choice are going to be problems that you have to work out anyway. How long is the midterm? Uh, 40 to 50 questions, something like that. Okay. 
Do they take as long as these? Like, are we taking it in one day? Oh, yeah. So, uh, they're not going to be like, if there's 40 questions, they're not going to all be like the hardest ones. Or no, no. Okay. There'll be some easy duck questions. Like the one on the front like that I couldn't figure out? Like the vertical motion. Yeah. What's the two this one? Yeah. Do you know how long I stared at that? Okay. Now, like, yes, like, no, what's this? Let's <laughs> talk about problem number 20, because I saw the most bizarre stuff happen on number 20. <laughs> Oh my God! Right. I saw literally. I saw <laughs> centimeters divided by no. something. I don't know what I did. That yeah, magically really turned into meters per second it. squared. I, right. it. I had 196 like, newton force like, applied to this thing. <laughs> that, that was kind of cool. That's like a small rocket engine. Okay. 199. Look. I'm gonna look at your. <laughs> Leave everything else out. Just focus on the cart. Just don't worry about the magnet, don't worry about the string, don't worry about anything else. Just worry about the cart. What's the only force that's going to make the cart move? Force parallel, which is going to act down the hill. Okay? So you can go, oh, force parallel, mg sine theta. Okay? And that's like, and that's going to be acting down, so that's going to be like a negative value. And some of you included the mass out here, okay, in this mass of the cart. No, it isn't like this mass is sitting on top of it. It's connected to a string, but it isn't part of that force parallel. So I got this force parallel acting down. Okay, cool. Now, and I tell you that in the, explicitly, this thing is going to move down the hill. It's going to move down the hill. And down is negative. So I know my net force has to be negative. I know my acceleration has to be negative. Okay? Those things have to happen. So here's the magnet. And I tell you, the magnet is providing an opposing force. So which direction is the force going to act since it's rolling downhill? Uh, up. Now, you didn't even have to calculate that. 0 0.088 newtons. That's it. Boom. There's nothing to do. Now, so if it were just these two, and this force parallel was what, negative 0.314, something like that? I don't know, whatever it is. Okay? So if it were just these two, if it were just these two forces, the net force would be the difference between the two of them. Divide that by the total mass of the system, boom, there's your acceleration. But we complicated it a little bit. We put a 20 gram mass out here. Now, it's got to drag the 20 gram mass. So is the 20 gram mass going to act as an opposing force since it's going downhill? Yeah. So you change that into kilograms, multiply it by G, you get 0.196 newtons. So I've got a 0.196 newton force acting up provided by this weight. I've got a 0.088 newton force acting up created by the magnet. The only force acting down is this. This plus this plus this, boom, there's your net force divided by the total mass there from acceleration. So if you had the wrong net force, but you did everything else right, I only took off the two points for the jacked up net force. Okay, so if, if I could see what you did, because that problem is worth eight points. So if you had the wrong net force, but I could follow what you did after that, I gave you the points. Okay? So if I circled it and said, okay, that's what that means. Uh, and a number, that on problem 21, God, we went over that. There were problems like this on the review. The first one was the easiest problem on the test. You take 0.5 kilograms, multiply it by 9.8, you get 4.9, divide it by 2 kilograms, there's an acceleration. Boom. That's it. That's all you had to do. That was it. That was it. The second one's a little bit more complicated, but again, the friction only exists up on the table. That's the only opposing force. Okay, so there is another version of the test that you can take. Again, I'll do the weighted average, 60% on the new, 40% on the old. That needs to happen sometime next week, okay? So if you want to do that, that's cool. If you're happy with your score, that's cool too. So, all right. Okay, so 
here's what we've got in the next three days. So we've got projectile motion, which will take us today, Monday, Tuesday. Then we'll review on Wednesday, midterm final, next Thursday. Okay, so that's kind of the sequence of what we're looking at. So with projectile motion, the good news is about projectile motion, literally there are no new equations to learn. Okay. We tweak them, we tweak existing ones, but there's no new equations to learn. Okay? We just have to figure out how to use the ones that we're already doing. Now. So when you look at projectile motion, basically it involves something being thrown in the air and traveling. And so there's two general forms of projectile motion. What we'll deal with today is what's known as lemming problems. So a lemming problem is when a car, a lemming, whatever, goes jumping off of the hill horizontally. Okay? So if you know what lemmings are famous for, they're all famous for like running off the edge of the cliff and all jumping into the sea. And it's a horrible thing. It's overblown, but it does happen on a small scale. Okay, so you got lemming problems. And then the other one, it's like a golf shot or a baseball that's hit up in the air or a football that's kicked or a soccer, okay? Where it goes up, boom, and it comes back down. So those are the two general forms of what we got going. Okay, so here's what's common to both of them. Oddly enough, in both situations, you're going to have an acceleration caused by gravity. Because no matter what, once it leaves, even though it's going up like this, or even though this thing is going out, once it clears the surface or it clears your foot or the golf club or whatever, the only force acting on it is gravity. So on both of these, you're going to have the same acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? So that's going to be the same for both of these. Now, here's the other key thing that we're going to talk about. And this is going to make life simpler, actually. We're going to assume that as this thing flies through the air, it's going to have a, a certain horizontal velocity, of Vx. Okay? So this is where we're going to make this simple. We're going to assume that our horizontal velocity in the x direction doesn't change. Okay? Actually, it does, because if you've ever like tried to like hit a golf ball or a soccer ball or something like that into a strong south wind, you know that, hey, that thing goes up in the air, goes boom, just drops like a rock. Or if you kick it with the wind, it carries a lot farther. So, but that gets complicated because then you have to get into drag coefficients and then you have horizontal accelerations and it gets weird. So we're just going to make it simple and we're going to assume that our horizontal velocity stays constant. So, and that's going to stay true in both of these. So Vx doesn't change. Same thing over here. There's going to be no change. So what, if you ever establish the Vx, if you ever know the Vx at one point, you know the Vx at every point. Now, what has to happen in terms of forces to have a constant velocity in the x direction. There's two things that can happen to create a constant velocity in the horizontal direction. There's two distinct situations. What's one option that I have a constant Vx? <clears throat> Meet. What's one option that I have a constant Vx? All the forces add up to zero. All the forces add up equal to zero. So when this ball is flying through the air, one option is that I have one force pushing it forward, counteracting an opposing force in the opposite direction. Okay? So when this thing leaves, I've got like a little thruster that pushes it forward, which is balancing out the drag going in the opposite direction. That's one option. Okay? It's one option. This treadway, what's the other option? You have the simpler option. An object in motion, unless... So there's no opposing force. Yeah. The other option is that we're just assuming that there's no forces acting in the x direction. So for lack of a force, horizontally, I don't get an acceleration. So we're just going to go with that option. Okay? 
the little rocket engines would be cool, don't get me wrong, but it's just not going to work. So we're just going to assume that whatever, ha whatever velocity you have in the x-direction stays constant because we're just going to assume that there aren't any forces acting in the x-direction. Now, vertically, are there forces? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. There's gravity. That, oh, yeah. Anything else? No. No? Okay. So, gravity's going to be falling down, right? Is gravity going to create an acceleration? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of, perhaps, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So, I have forces acting vertically, but no forces acting horizontally. Now, here's the golden rule with these problems. In, and it's similar to the uh, ad that they used to run for Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Okay? Here's how you remember this. What happens in the X stays in the X. What happens in the Y stays in the Y. Ooh. Nary the two Ooh. shall meet. Okay? So, because horizontally, I don't have a force, that's cool. But that has nothing to do with the vertical motion. I have a vertical acceleration, but that's only in the y direction. But I don't have any acceleration in the y direction because, or excuse me, in the x direction because there aren't any forces. So gravity only affects the vertical motion. Horizontally, there are no forces, so it remains constant. So in some ways, it's like the limb lap, you know, when we talked about, you know, when you're flying that thing on the moon. You only change direction horizontally with, with the space. Thrusters. Yeah, when you fire the thrusters, because there's no external force. So this is maintains a constant Vx because of inertia. Now, if I push something off of the table and there's no gravity, what would it do? Yeah, it would just go straight across like this. So the only reason that you see a change in the path is because of the fact that you're, you're creating an acceleration. Okay. So, let's kind of start back at the beginning. So, pretend that you're back in the acceleration unit, back before there were forces and life was something. And you think, at that time you're going, wow, this is so difficult. And now you look at it and go, oh, this is so easy. So, I've got a uh, golf ball that I'm going to hold up at about two meters and I'm going to drop it. Okay? So, pretend that we're not talking about projectile motion. I'm just going to drop this ball and it's going to fall two meters. So, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It's accelerating. Okay? <laughs> it does begin to accelerate. It actually is accelerating because it's speeding up. It's yeah. not decelerating. Not <laughs> <laughs> he said it was decelerating, so I'm talking about what? it's not decelerating. <laughs> no, we did not. He's not decelerating because this thing is speeding up. Though. Now, the what's slow. the initial velocity? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> now, here, what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to introduce Vy. Okay? So this is like VO. So because eventually I want to talk about horizontal velocities as well. So I want to kind of start designating it, okay, which velocity am I talking about? Am I talking about my vertical velocity or my horizontal velocity? So it sounds like a really bad physics game, you know, VO. Okay. So V naught, zero. So what I want to figure out is how long it takes to hit the ground. So, Kendra, what can I do? Do you want to know how long did it take? To hit the ground. To hit the ground. Well, you need to find um, the velocity. No. No? The acceleration. I got that. You do? Where's that at? Uh, all around you. Oh, okay. Right. All around Oh. All around <laughs> Yeah. Then it's the... I mean, technically um, there is gravity. It's the one yeah, where it only has the V-naught in the equation and not the V at the end. I don't know what that exactly is. <laughs> How about yeah. dimensional T or distance equals one half A squared plus V-naught time? Yeah, and then solve for T. 
What is going on? Gravity. <laughs> That's what's going on. And then you're not even going to move. Like, yeah. Get it out of here. Kyle. <laughs> 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 what is going on? Yeah. 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 Chill out. Seriously. Yeah. 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 All over A equals C. Yeah, it's like we're teaching a bunch of freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> all over A, all over A, all over A equals T. We're still trying to figure out the simple equation for time. I know it. And then <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and teach this lesson right now. Okay, feel free. Okay, so we're gonna find the T. We're gonna find the time. So, uh, guys, can we get your full attention, please? Yeah. Can somebody grab their calculator? Mr. Edge is out here. Okay. So, I'm going to take two times and make you give me a clinician. What? <laughs> what is going on? I don't know where. Where's that square root? <laughs> because t is squared. Yeah. Do you get it now? <laughs> and then you find t. And then when you... Okay, that's all. That's, just, that's all I want to do. For now. That's all I want to do for now. Check out the old big dog. Okay. So, somebody take 4, divided by 9.8, and take the square root of that. So point six three what? Eight. Six digits. Six three eight. A little over half a second. It'd be six three nine. Six three nine. A little over half a second. Okay. A little over half a second. Right? So we're dropping them. Now, let's talk about what I need to do this calculation and what I don't need to do to put in here. Do I need the color of the golf ball? No. No. Not a fact. Maybe. Not, not there. No. Absorbing. Not, shh, no. Absorbing. Think about what about the mass of the golf ball? Yes. Can you even know that? Really? No. Where do I plug in mass? Sorry. <laughs> Why is it square root? Okay. How about the number of dimples on the golf ball? Golf ball doesn't no, Honestly, in that no. Probably not. So there's a whole bunch of things that I don't need. Responsibly. The average rainfall in the Amazon forest. Don't need that. That's the distance. Okay? Not for this problem. Not for this problem. Only if it's so, what are the only two things I need to determine how long it's going to be in the air? Distance, how far it falls, and acceleration. And acceleration. That's it. That's the only thing I need. That's also really cool to think about. Okay? Get your foot off my You're going to upset him. Now, with all that said, there's two famous problems that come out of projectile motion. This is one of them. So, one of them is that you've got a gun. Okay. Wow. Is there also an animal? Oh, yeah. So it comes in school. The race is now. The race is. Shut up, we're all physics. I'm hunting in Africa. So, welcome to the real world. See a tiger. Here's the setup. What kind of gun is that? Is that a revolver? Yes. Ray goes. Okay. I'm going to shoot a bullet. Okay. I'm going to shoot a bullet. It's a grapple gun. Exactly horizontal. Okay? Exactly horizontal. Not shooting it up, not shooting it down. Zero degrees. I'm shooting it at exactly zero degrees. Okay? Now, at the exact instant that this bullet leaves the barrel, I'm going to drop one and have it fall. Okay? This is your setup. This would get shot out exactly horizontal. Say it has a horizontal velocity, I don't know, 200 meters per second. Okay? And at the exact same instant this one is shot out, I drop one. So here's the big question. Which one hits the ground first? Really don't. No. Gravity is the only thing acting on it. It's stay in the X and Y is to stay in the Ys. It's the same time. So, look, look, look at the calculations that we just did. So, if you look at that time equaling 2 D, 2 times the distance over uh, your acceleration. So, what's the only thing that you need to plug into this equation? But isn't that one accelerating? Aren't you finding it out? So, that one's going to have a 
Yeah, the bigger acceleration. acceleration. Negative 9.8 meters per second. Because we're only talking about the slide. So, or are you just saying... <laughs> yeah, I've got a very small version of this guy. So I've got one. This isn't shh. Okay, so when it fires, it'll shoot this one out this way. Then on the back side. That plunger sticks out, and this one has a hole in it that I'll put on back here. So when this one's fired, oh my gosh. So, that would just fall straight down. Things? You have contraption wow. exactly for Where do you buy these? Yeah. He made it. I, I bought this one. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, he did not make that. Yeah. Trust me. Do you have toys for everything? Not everything. Okay. So what we're going to do, so turn this. So, I'm going to have this up here. Okay? So, at the exact instant that this one gets shot off, and we're about two meters tall, this one's going to begin to fall. Okay? So. Inclination, I quit him. Oh my I knew god. It. I told you, Kendra. Well, You're wrong. Kendra, Kendra, you Kendra, don't mind him. All right. He doesn't understand what Kendra, we understand. Kendra, did you say you knew it? Let it be known. That when a bullet right. no, flies I through the air sometimes, I said, well, air resistance pushes it up longer than it should. That's so flat. Quote, yeah. right. She was technically correct. Okay. Once again, now, that is still flat. Now, there, this is as a bullet traveling to Now, there's a couple of situations where this isn't true. If the bullet's going fast enough and it's high enough off the ground, actually what comes into play is the curvature of the earth, Ooh, where the earth actually begins to curve away, and the one that's shot will actually fall, has a further distance to travel, so it's actually in the air longer. But that's a pretty extreme case. Okay? Sometimes you can get a little bit of aerodynamic lifting from the bullet, Usually not oh, very much. Okay? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I said usually it's not very much. Usually okay? it's a pretty retarded. extreme case for that to become an issue. Extreme. Okay? Yeah, but but here, for, for the sake of what we've got, exactly. for the sake of what we've got, exactly. whether this thing is shot or if this thing falls, no matter what the horizontal velocity is, that 200, guess what? Here's my point. There's any number of things that I can't plug in to determine the time. I can't plug in the color of the golf ball. I can't plug in the mass of the golf ball. I can't plug in the horizontal velocity. So no matter what that horizontal velocity is, it doesn't matter in terms of the calculation of time. Man, I have so much more respect for time. No, for the old philosophers and that's scientists. All right. So we're good with this. Now, let's go back to the initial problem. This thing's going to fall two meters. So we're going to drop one, and at the same time, we're going to shoot one out with a horizontal velocity of, I don't know, five meters per second. Okay? So here's the deal. As this thing goes through the air, and as it falls, what happens to the value of that Vx? It stays the same. Stays the same. Okay? Because there's no horizontal acceleration, because there's no horizontal force. So, no matter what, that thing isn't going to change. Even when it lands, it's going to have a horizontal velocity of 5 meters per second. So, when you have horizontal velocity, or any velocity that stays constant, and you have a time, what do we have for the time? 0.639? Yeah. Okay? Now, for now, I don't want to worry about this one, okay? 
We'll worry about this one later. So here's my question. LA can run at 5 meters per second. And LA runs 4.639 seconds. How far did you go? 3.15. Shut up. Ellie. How can you figure out how far it went? Beautiful. So if you look at this, and if you revisit this from a velocity time graph standpoint, so on a velocity time graph, for the one that shot out, the horizontal velocity is going to be a horizontal line like this at 5 meters per second. Okay? And we know the time is 0.639 seconds. So basically on a velocity time graph, we find the area. You're multiplying 5 meters per second times 0.639 seconds. Now, in the terminology of projectile motion, this horizontal distance is called range. Okay? Range. So when you're talking about how far something travels horizontally, that's range. It might be from the cliff all the way out if you're talking about a golf ball. It might be from the point that you hit it to the point that it lands. If you're talking about a baseball, let's say, for example, the Cubbies go, you know, go yard tonight. And let's say it doesn't land all the way to the ground, but it actually lands in the stands. Okay? So no matter what, the range is just the distance that the object travels. That's it. Okay? It doesn't have to all be all the way to the ground, but a lot of times it is. So range is just the horizontal distance. So this range is going to equal your horizontal velocity times time. So range is going to equal Vx time. All this is is a very, very fancy way of saying distance is velocity times time. What's the only time you can use this equation? When there's no acceleration, and that's what we have going on horizontally. Okay? So, horizontally, I can use this because there's no acceleration. I can't use this vertically because there is an acceleration. So, horizontally, my velocity time graph is a horizontal line. It isn't vertically because I'm accelerating. Okay? Got that. Good? So, what is the... 5 meters per second times 0.639. I don't know. Somebody take 5. No, no. I, range. It's, just, it's just the horizontal distance that's going to travel. Yeah. Out of curiosity, take, somebody take 5. 3.195. What? It is. That so it is. It is. Oh, I thought he was just shouting so, them out. <laughs> let's just call it 3.2 meters. So this thing's going to travel about 3.2 meters. Okay, so about three long steps, that's how far it's going to go. Okay, so let's kind of clear the board here. So, coming off five meters per second. Boom, we got this. It's following two meters. It's going to land at five meters per second. It's going to travel 3.2 meters. Okay, so we got this going on. Now, let's talk vertically. So vertically, we said it was going to fall for 0.639 seconds. Now, let's just go back to a ball that's dropped. Okay, we'll, we'll merge both of these ideas back together. Let's go back to the ball that's dropped. And let's assume that we don't know the time. Let's assume that we don't know the time. Yeah, you're going to have to erase it. Yeah. I think you can mentally handle this. Here. You don't know the time. No, we're waiting. No, 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 if I'm just going to drop this ball, and I'm assuming I don't know this time, what can I do to find the vertical velocity of the ball when it lands? Brooklyn, what can I use? 
I know an initial velocity, I know a distance, and I know an acceleration. That is a pretty good question. No one asked you. I'm just saying that I was I a pretty good question. I understand. Okay. So I know an initial velocity, I know a distance, I know acceleration. What equation relates all of those? Beautiful. That equation. So I've got d squared equals v naught squared plus 2ax. Now, here's what you have to be very, 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 very careful of. If you look at this thing being launched out horizontally, don't put 5 meters per second in here as your initial velocity. What happens in the x stays in the x. What happens in the y stays in the y. So whether I drop this ball or I shoot it out horizontally, no matter what, that initial vertical velocity is zero. So don't put in the 5 meters per second as that initial velocity. It doesn't have any initial velocity, whether I drop it or if it gets shot out. So this goes away. I've got 2ax. So again, what are the only two things, Kendra, that are going to determine how the velocity of that ball at impact. What are the only two things that you need? The acceleration and the distance. Bingo. That's the only thing I need. The horizontal velocity isn't a factor here. The mass of the ball isn't a factor. Okay? The fact that it's Friday, not a factor. Okay? We don't plug in the day of the week because it doesn't matter. Okay? So, in this case, I'll take 2 times negative 9.8 meters per second squared times the distance of negative 2 meters. So basically, somebody take 4 times 9.8 and square root of that, you should get 6 something. 6.26. 6.26 meters per second. And is that... Or no, that's vertical? That's my vertical velocity. Now, here's what's important. This vertical velocity is going to be this one, if I drop it straight down, or if I shoot it out like this, that when they land, they're both going to have the exact same vertical velocity. Doesn't make any difference. Drop it, shoot it, doesn't matter. Okay? Does not matter. Now, let's look at this one when it lands. When this one lands, it's got a horizontal component of 5 meters per second. It's got a vertical component of 6.26 meters per second. So how can I figure out the speed? In other words, imagine when this ball is coming in like this, I've got a little radar gun down here that I can measure the speed of the ball. So it has a horizontal component of 5 meters per second. It's got a vertical component of 6.26. So how can I figure out how fast it's actually going? Gosh. Oh. 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 Is that a right angle? It is. Because oh. there's some Vx. And there's some Vy. Ooh. 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 Yeah. 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 Little Pythagorean yeah. theorem. Get in touch with square. Getting in touch with your inner Greek. Okay? Or geek, whatever it's like. So, somebody take 5 squared, 6.26 squared, square root of all of that. Eight point zero one Meters per second. Okay? Now, so what this tells me is that if you had a little radar gun down here in the floor, just as that ball hit the ground, that radar would be reading 8.01 meters per second. Yes? No, hold on. Keep talking. Okay. Now, if you measured it right at this point, if you had the radar gun pointing at this point, what would the speed be? If, if you were shooting the radar gun right at this instant, right as it leaves the ramp, 
what would the speed be? Five meters per second. So as it falls, what happens to your five meters per second? Stays the same. But your vertical velocity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So as, it, as the vertical velocity gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your vector is going to point further and further down because your y component is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So this is why it's going to speed up. Now, what else could we find? Could we find this angle? We could. Okay, so if we want to know the impact angle, we could just do a little inverse tangent of 6.26 over 5 and get that angle. Okay. So what is that, 8.01? We can no. find a lot That's of the hypotenuse. We can even it find the what guard distance, field. This is what the is, hypotenuse. We can find total good? distance travel. That's even. the speed yeah. that when it hits the ground. That's yes. Just, that's okay. just awesome. But, we don't, but I won't. We won't. I now, love that. here's what you cannot do yeah. with projectile motion. Speaking of distance, here's what you can't do is draw a, and make this thing a triangle and say, oh, it rolls, it comes off the hill and then it goes like this. Okay? It's not, okay? It's a parabolic curve. Okay? That's, so don't do this to get the distance. You can use right triangles on this, but you can't do a right triangle to describe the path of it. And that was actually a, a, quite an argument for a while. What was the actual path of the projectile? Italians were big into that argument because they needed to figure out how to launch rocks at a castle. Okay. No, true story. It was it's it's called impetus. And we'll talk and that makes more sense when you get into the ground and ground problem. Now let's play a little what if game. Okay? What would happen to the time? Okay? What would happen to the time that's in the air? If instead of going at 5 meters per second, I launch at 10 meters per second. Howie, what's that going to do to the time if I go from 5 meters per second to 10 meters per second? Shut up. What's it going to do? Why? Because you're going faster. Okay. Now. Let's, let's jump back here. What did we use to calculate the time that it's in the air? The distance and the acceleration. So is my horizontal velocity a factor in this? No. So if it goes twice as fast horizontally, what's it going to do to the time? It's going to stay the exact same. So whether I drop it or if I shoot it out 10 meters per second, this number isn't going to change. Okay? It won't do anything to it. Well, now, will it go twice as far? Yes, because it's going to have twice the velocity in the same amount of time. Okay. Okay. Now, let's do this. What if instead of at 2 meters, we make it 4 meters? Will that double the time? It's going to fall twice as far as the time going to double. Uh, if you look at your equation, oh, it's going to go okay. It's going to go quadratic relationship. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. One option is that you can do smash mouth physics. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay, that's me. So it's going to be two times four meters divided by negative nine point eight meters per second squared. Okay, it's smash mouth physics. What do you get? Uh, 8.816. 0.816. Okay? No. That's, that's, oh, that's right. a square root. You forgot to square root it. Yeah. I got 0.904. What did you get? 0.904. 
0.904 seconds. Now, when it was at 2 meters, the time was 0.639. Okay? So clearly, we didn't double the time because this would have to be like 1.2 something. Okay? So the time didn't double. Even though we doubled the height, we didn't double the time. So this is smash mouth physics. It works. It's beautiful. You like that, go with it. Now, here's a little bit more elegant approach to it. Just a little bit. So if you look at the initial one, which is 2x over a. So this is, the, no matter what it is, this is how I'm going to calculate my initial value of time. I don't know what the numbers are. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. This is just how I'm going to get it. But now I'm going to change it up. So my new condition, okay, what we call T prime, which is going to be the new set of calculations, is going to be two times. Now I'm going to double the height. So what do I have to do to double the height? I've got to multiply x by 2. So that's going to become 2x over a. Okay, it's just a slightly more elegant approach. Now, here's where the magic happens. You still don't go, okay, you did that, but who cares? Here's where the, the magic takes place. Can I write this as the square root of 2 times 2a, excuse me, 2x over a? Is this the same as this? Yep. It's the exact same. But why would you want to do that? And I'll tell you why. Because somebody do this. Somebody take the square root of 2 and multiply that by 0 0.639. 0 0.903. 4. You, it's the same thing. Okay? So, just... Okay? So, because it's underneath the radical, when you double anything that's underneath the radical, assuming that it's on top, you're going to increase everything by the square root of 2. So it just saves you going through and redoing all the calculations. Now, if I wanted to actually double the time, think this through. If I wanted to double the time, what would I have to do to my height? If you follow the same thought process. Would you have to multiply by 4? Yeah, I'd have to go up by a factor of 4. So <coughs> if I make my height 4 times greater, then this becomes 4x. Then this becomes 2 times this, and my time would double. If I want to triple my time, what would I have to do to x? Make nine. it go up by a factor of? 9. 9. Okay? So that's the idea. So this, this is a little bit more elegant in terms of how it plays out. So, okay. So, we're good. Fantastic. So, the lab itself is pretty simple. You're going to take... I got this. Hold on. Keep that rolling. I've got It is rolling. It's the table. Did the table sneak up on it? It did. The ball fell back. So... You're going to take yonder ramp like this, and you're going to clamp that to the edge of the table. Okay? So imagine this is clamped like this. Clamps. Then you're going to take a marble, hold it up on the edge of the ramp, let it roll down. No. Okay? And then when it goes flying off, it's going exactly horizontal. So this is just basically a lemming problem. So your setup is going to be like this. It's going to roll. Here's the edge of the table. Boom, it's going to come out here, and it's going to land some distance away from the table. So to get a precise landing spot, let it roll, okay, so you have an idea of where it's going to land. Then take a sheet of paper and lay that down on the floor, once you kind of know where it's going to land. Then take a piece of carbon paper with the diamond side up, put that down where it's going to land. So the beauty of the carbon paper is that when it lands, it's going to transfer a mark to the paper. No, that's sorcery. <laughs> now, so how, car how carbon paper used to work back when dinosaurs walked the earth and everybody manually typed things. You didn't have copiers, literally. There just weren't copiers around. 
So if you wanted to make a duplicate copy, so let's say you were sending off an application to your school. So you'd have a piece of paper, and then you'd have a piece of carbon paper in between, like this. Then, when you would type, because it was a mechanical process, the key would come up, like let's say you're typing the letter K. So you would hit the letter K, the arm would come up, it would strike the paper. Then it would transfer that image of the K back to the second one. So this is why when you look at emails and, and it, it's a CC, that CC stands for carbon copy. So if you wanted to send someone a duplicate of it, it would be a carbon copy of the original letter. So that's where the CC on email comes from, is because it used to have to be done with carbon paper. So here's what you're going to measure. You need two bits of data, how far it falls, and then the measurement, how far it goes out. But make sure when you're measuring this horizontal distance that you measure from the edge of the ramp. Don't measure from necessarily the base of the table. Measure the distance that it goes from the edge of the ramp out to this point. Those are the only two bits of data that you need. When you get to... I need a new piece of card. Okay. <sighs> that too. All right. So when you get down to question six and seven on the front, listen to me very carefully. Okay. On the this on the number six, it's a horizontal velocity time graph. So imagine this: we're going to drop a ball at the exact same time that one rolls off the edge of the cliff. So I want both things drawn. What's the velocity time graph horizontally going to look like for the one that is dropped and for the one that rolls off? Okay. Now, on number seven, you're going to draw a velocity time graph. One for the ball that goes flying off and the other one that falls straight down. So make sure that I know which line is which. Now, on the one on number seven, we're defining down as being negative, so that's why there's that zero meters per second line. You don't have to have exact values. It's just what's the shape of this thing going to look like. Okay? When you get to the back side on problem number one, you're driving a car off of a cliff. So, I'm serious, this is what you're doing. So, you want to figure out how long it's in the air, how far it's going to go, what's the velocity when it lands. So there's two situations down below. On the first one in the middle it says if the horizontal velocity was doubled, how would each of the following change? Do not just say, oh, it would get bigger, oh, it would get smaller. There's two ways you can answer these. You can either mathematically calculate it. In other words, do the smash mouth physics, go, hey, I'm going to double it, I'm going to recalculate everything. Or you can say, oh, it's going to triple, it's going to go up by the square root of 5, whatever. And then the same thing is going to happen if we double the height of the cliff. So just don't say, oh, it gets bigger, or worse yet, it's different, or it changes. Okay? Bad. Bad, bad, bad. Oh. Uh, when you get on, the, on your calculations, let me jump back to that first page for a second, because you want to find the resultant velocity, which is how fast you're going. So it's got a Vx and it's got a Vy. The angle that I want, just give me this angle right here. Don't worry about making it negative, okay? So this angle is typically around 70 or 80 degrees. So this is just the angle that I want, just that angle with the horizontal. Don't overthink it, just give me that angle. Okay, I'm done, you're on your own.